nights at 10 on the history they fight their way back over the kansas border and retake fort gibson this so-called buffer zone the no man's land between the forces of the north and the south is too important to abandon to the confederacy it's really a gateway to get to arkansas and then to the mississippi and then ultimately to new orleans not to mention your your way down to texas so they really saw it as a key element to preserving the West. The Union was worried about losing Missouri. They saw if they lost Missouri, then the whole Western theater would fall. Three days after they retake Fort Gibson, the Union soldiers are approached by John Ross, official leader of the Cherokee, though actually he represents only a faction. The other half of the tribe, led by his longtime rival, Stan Waity, has already joined the Confederacy. A lot of the Civil War in Indian Territory had more to do with the old blood feud vendettas than it did with national issues. It's really more along political lines than it is anything else. The Union sends Ross to Fort Scott, Kansas for protection. He eventually makes his way to Washington, where he spends the rest of the war pleading the Cherokee cause to the government. He went to Washington and lobbied for the Cherokees, saying that not all the Cherokees were bad, that many of them supported the Union and uh, were fighting for the Union. But Stan Waity is doing much to refute those claims. He becomes known as the territory's most formidable guerrilla fighter. His specialty was, was truly uh, keeping a, a, a mounted rifle unit. It's really kind of an 1840s uh, terminology in the Army used to describe what we today would, would term as a Green Beret unit. These were highly mobile individuals with a wide variety of skills that could live off of the land and they could hit very hard and totally dissipate into the, uh, into the countryside. Early on, Waity participates in several regimented battles in and around Indian Territory. Most notably, the Battle of Wilson's Creek in 1861, after which he is made a colonel in the Confederate Army. But he soon decides that conventional warfare is not for him. In the beginning of the war, Stan Waity is almost captured twice. Uh, at Cowskin Prairie and then again at Fort Wayne. And he learned from that very quickly that he didn't want to do a set piece with the Union because they were generally better equipped and uh, uh, better trained. And that's do a set piece battle, Napoleonic style. In 1862, when the Union Army returns to Indian Territory, Waity finds a more suitable target. Stan Waity saw to it that not only Fort Gibson was being harassed after its reoccupation by federal troops, but their supply lines coming out of Fort Scott, Kansas, were under constant harassment or seizure by uh, Stan Waity and his men. Any Union soldier who leaves the safety of the fort risks a deadly encounter. He became a hit-and-run artist, and he was very good at it. That success is reflected in the unorthodox appearance of his men. Uh, Wadey's boys uh, are accused many times of being dressed as Federals. The Confederacy wasn't able to send them uh, uniforms or equipment or ammunition or food. So the only place that the Confederates, if they wanted to uh, keep themselves fed, clothed, and uh, supplied with ammunition, was to take it from the Union. Supplies of any kind are scarce in Indian Territory. In the course of the war, nearly every settlement is put to the torch. More than 90 battles will be fought in its streets and fields as the Confederates use it to draw in and bog down more and more Union troops. To a large extent, it was a way to divert Union attention from the Eastern Front. And that was one of the centers of, of the strategy of the Confederacy. Each time a major Confederate campaign is launched in the East, Stan Waity redoubles his attacks along the Kansas border, drawing Union soldiers away from where they are needed most. The frustrated Federal troops make Waity their primary target, as his daring raids capture the imagination of the public and the press, which dubs him the Red Fox. They called Stan Waity the Red Fox. 
um, because he was slippery and hard to catch. And uh, he'd appear when you would least expect him to, getting your chickens out of the chicken coop, so to speak. But Waitie's greatest fame comes near the end of the war, shortly after his promotion to brigadier general. In the summer of 1864, Waitie learns from a prisoner of war that a Union wagon train bearing a million dollars worth of supplies is about to leave Fort Scott for Fort Gibson. They're supplying uh, about 3,000 troops and about 9,000 refugees. Uh, so that's a lot of food supplies, tentage, clothing that all has to come down in here. 300 wagons pulled by four up mules. Uh, so it was huge. Waitie knows the route they will take. He confers with one of his white counterparts, a Texas brigadier general named Richard Gano, and outlines a daring plan of attack. On September 18th, the two generals gather some 2,000 troops, half white, half Cherokee, on the high bluffs around Cabin Creek. As darkness falls, they approach the spot where the wagon train, guarded by about 460 well-armed federal troops, has camped for the night. Troops are bedded down for the most part, you know, they got their boots off, they got their shoes off, their, their uh, rifles are stacked. Uh, they're either in their tents or laying out on the stars, and they're asleep. The mules are quietly grazing. Under cover of darkness, Waitie's men ford the creek and approach from the west. Gano's men close in from the east. The creek itself becomes their third flank. Their first target, however, is not the sleeping men, but the mules tethered a short distance away. And the next thing you know, there's cannon fire. The mules stampede, taking with them the only chance the Union has to move their wagons out of the line of fire. Now you're waking up out of a dead sleep to cannon fire, first of all. Then you're trying to get your shoes on, you're trying to find your rifle, and mules are running through, just kicking and going crazy. It's at night, you're disoriented, you have no idea of where, you, where to set a line of battle. You have no idea where the enemy is coming from. In the confusion, the federal troops break and run. So the Union never could really put up a good defense. And then the Confederates just swooped down on top of them. With more than 160 federal troops killed or wounded and only 45 Confederate dead, Waitie and Gano load up what they can and burn the rest of the supply train. There's some 300 wagons, hundreds of mules, and livestock were taken in that raid, and in each of those wagons badly needed food, clothing, armament, powder, all of the munitions and supplies needed to continue the war. The generals managed to elude the reinforcements sent from Fort Gibson and escape with their prize. The high-profile victory unnerves the Union and boosts Confederate morale. The South seems poised to take back Indian territory and push northward, but it is not to be. In the East, the Union General William Tecumseh Sherman has reached Atlanta. The tide is about to turn. Unfortunately, as big as that victory was, and it was lauded all the way to uh, Jefferson Davis' office, still it was too little too late for the Confederacy and the Cherokee Nation. The Confederate forces are destined to be drawn away from their successes in the Indian Territory. Another conflict, unfolding hundreds of miles away, is about to change the momentum of the war. Deep in the swamps of the South, another warrior readies for battle. Like Stan Waitie, his is not a fight of ideology or of the issues of succession or slavery, but a war of personal retribution and revenge. 1865, 